So I'm going to get started. I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, my name is Stephanie Robert, and it's my pleasure to be the director of the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work. Uh, before I introduce our speaker and moderator today, I'm going to start us off with a land acknowledgement. University of Wisconsin-Madison and the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work occupy an ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called Peixote since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both the federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. The history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison and the Sandra Rosenbaum School of Social Work respect the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation, along with the 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. Now for just a bit of housekeeping before we get going. Uh, this presentation is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel at a later date. Uh, regarding CEUs, to register, you were required to provide your name and email. So this allows us to log our attendees and email you information on CEUs, which will be distributed, distributed via email at a later date. We have your cameras and microphones off during the session today. However, we really do want your questions. So you can use the Q&A link that's at the bottom of your screen to submit questions throughout the talk or at the end of the talk. I wanna thank our alumni and supporters whose donations make events like this possible. I want to especially acknowledge Professor Emerita, Dr. Diane Kravitz, who created our Fund for Women, Leadership and Social Change, which is supporting today's talk. Our facilitator today is Sungmi Cho, who is an outstanding doctoral student in our social welfare doctoral program. Ms. Cho is currently working on an exciting dissertation building from her years of experience addressing social justice issues broadly and particularly those facing international adoptees. Now to briefly introduce our speaker. Selena Roldan is a proud graduate of our MSW program. Our school's board of visitors chose Ms. Roldan as the recipient of our 2021 Distinguished Alumni Award. This award is so well-deserved. Ms. Roldan is the CEO of the American Red Cross of Illinois, which is the second largest Red Cross region in the country. Prior to joining the Red Cross, Solana served as the executive director of the five locations of the Erie Neighborhood House in Chicago. She was co-chair for the city of Chicago's Universal Basic Income Task Force, a member of the mayor's Early Childhood Task Force, and served on the Illinois Human Service Commission. Currently, Selena is a member of the National Board of Unidos US. Selena has also been named one of Chicago's most powerful Latinos. We are so proud to call her our alumna. Um, on a more personal note, Selena was a student in one of the very first courses that I taught here at the school over 20 years ago. So it's also very rewarding to see all that she's accomplished. With that, I'm going to turn things over to Sung Mi. Wonderful, thank you so much, Professor Robert. Uh, thank you so much, Selena, Ms. Roldan for being here. It is a privilege to be able to facilitate this conversation with you. Um, and I also wanna thank your families, your communities for sharing you with us uh, so that we can get a, just a snapshot of your knowledge and insight and to be uplifted by you this afternoon. So to begin, uh, we would love to hear a little bit about your journey through social work into your current work with American Red Cross in Chicago. Uh, so you're welcome to just uh, tell us about your journey. 
Sure. Thank you so much for having me. And again, to the to the School of Social Work, it's just really an honor to be with all of you today. And so, um, yes, yeah, so I am a proud graduate um, of the School of Social Work at University of Wisconsin-Madison. And during my time there, um, I actually was focusing on um, correctional work and criminal justice during the time that I was there and learned so much. Um, I had a practical emplacement at Arc House, um, as well as at the Dane County Juvenile um, Correctional Facility. And um, but I will start by kind of saying that usually the work that we end up going to is often because of what we see and observe within our families and within our homes. Um, and I had two parents who truly taught me um, what it meant to serve with a servant heart. Um, I actually think they may be both registered and listening um, to this or maybe participating today, I believe. Um, and uh, both my parents, so my father, who is a Vietnam veteran and came back home and, and really told us that he wanted to live his life in honor of those who didn't make it back home. Um, and he was the first employee for an organization, um, Hispanic Housing Development Corporation, that became one of the largest um, Hispanic um, nonprofit organizations in the Midwest and uh, has have been developing affordable housing all over Chicago and Illinois. Um, my mother, a social worker um, by training uh, and is a psychotherapist who was a, a dean at the Institute for Clinical Social Work in, in Chicago and had a private practice. So I really um, saw the both of them kind of leading in this way, which really brought me to the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, I will say my experience working in, in the criminal justice settings, one of the things that I just was really thinking about was um, how much the social work program was social justice um, and was really focused on equity at a time. I mean, so many organizations, so many schools are talking about social justice and equity now, um, but they were then when I was there many years ago. And um, I really saw particularly in criminal justice settings, you know, what racial inequity look like at, at firsthand, which led me back to Chicago where I was doing work in an uh, Erie neighborhood house as much as an executive director there where uh, serving predominantly Latino families and children that were new immigrants, um, looking for services, looking for access. Um, and I was there for 15 years before going to the Red Cross, um, where I now serve uh, the Illinois Red Cross, as you mentioned, second largest region in the country. We serve 12.7 uh, million people during times of disasters and emergencies. Uh, the Red Cross is responsible for 40% of the nation's blood supply. In my Illinois region, we responded to over 2,000 disasters last year, primarily home fires. Um, we have over 3,600 volunteers that we count on to carry out our work every single day. So um, I think what's interesting about that is, you know, I'm a social worker by training. I have no disaster preparedness or official emergency management uh, education background, certainly training now in this moment. Um, and so it was a very big, uh, scary job to kind of walk into, but the mission of the Red Cross is to alleviate human suffering. And so when I think about social workers and I think about what we were trained to do, that is to alleviate human suffering. I had seen, and all of us have seen disasters in families, disasters in communities. And I think that's what really um, made it made me qualified to be able to walk into this role. And so, um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, I really spend about 60 to 70% of my job relying on the social work training that I received at the School of Social Work because I am listening to people. I am trying to support my team members that are going out and supporting people on the worst day of their lives. Wow, thank you so much for making that so personal and uh, for talking about your family who is with us both in terms of your insight, but also literally might be here, it sounds like. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I would love to hear more about some of those challenges or surprises that you talked about in your journey. Is there any insight that you can give us in terms of how to move through those um, for those of us who might be current students or in our work where we're confronted with challenges? I, you know, one of the things that I think I have, I'm just so grateful for in terms of um, having had to, the experience to be a social worker and be trained at um, the School of Social Work at Madison um, is that it really gave you the skill sets to do a lot of different kinds of work and to be prepared to take on a lot of 
different kinds of challenges. Um, and, and, you know, I remember when I started at the Red Cross and just things that you may not know that we do. And um, it was 2016 and the Cubs were in the World Series um, for those of you that may be from the Chicagoland area. And I remember I have a chief disaster officer where, you know, a regional disaster officer, which I still think is still amazing to me. So I have a chief communications officer, I have a, chief, a COO. And so my regional disaster officer came into my office and he said, okay, so the Cubs are in the World Series. And I said, I know, oh my gosh, isn't this exciting? And he said, mm, at the Red Cross, a little bit less exciting and really, you know, kind of laid out for me, you know, what we do, you know, whenever the city is at, you know, a, high, a heightened level of alert planning. You know, I watched the parade uh, once the Cubs actually won the Real World Series from our emergency operations um, center alongside, you know, members of the police department, the FBI, kind of knowing that there was 5 million people in the city that were all in the same place at the same time. So I think, you know, those are the kind of things that we may not always know that we do, but really be prepared to kind of know that the Red Cross laws does a lot of different kinds of work. Um, some of the, the harder things that I think that we've done, you know, that I've thankfully also had the skills in the background, the training from the School of Social Work have been some of the worst moments that I've had at the Red Cross. Um, I've been deployed uh, six times. Uh, so I've gone to different disasters. And so nationally, when we have larger scale disasters, we rely on staff and volunteers um, from all over the country. Um, I responded to Hurricane Harvey. I um, actually deployed with my mother who became trained as a disaster mental health worker to um, Puerto Rico during Hurricane Maria. I responded to the Paradise Wildfire in California. And last year I was in Oregon during the, the wildfires in Oregon as well. Um, and I, I think that, you know, one of the, the things that I think about is, is thankfully, you know, I've learned that I work with incredible people. I work with superheroes um, and what you kind of rely on yourself and what you learn about resiliency and trying to uh, make sure that you don't always take all of this work home with you, but you can do a lot of different things in this space that we had um, about in, on August 26, 2018, there was a fire in a little village, which is the community of Chicago. And sometimes with bigger fires, I'll get the call, I'll either want to be there on the scene, sometimes there's press, sometimes we're dealing with elected officials, and I got a call early Sunday morning saying, Slana, there's been a fire and there's been fatalities. Um, and I said, you know, I can be there in 15 minutes. And then, you know, as my chief communications officer was calling me, she was saying, um, you know, Slana, there's been children, there were children in the fire. Um, and, you know, it's I, sometimes I think this is also what, you know, is, is challenging about my role is I, I, you don't always have all the information you need and you're having to make decisions and do things in that moment and kind of what we learned about crisis management. Um, and by the time I got on scene, they had confirmed that 10 children had died in this fire, um, ages um, six months to 16 years of age. Um, and to be there in this most chaotic, horrific circumstance, just people on the street and families and neighbors are Red Crossers that had been there at four o'clock in the morning when the fire had actually started. Um, it was, it was traumatic. It was a trauma for all of those, even for my team that weren't there on this on the scene that day. And to know that I at least had the training or the background to be able to support our teams, um, the community um, that was going this her through this horrific event. Um, I think those are the things that, you know, whether it's, you know, because the Cubs won the World Series or being there for a community on its absolutely worst day, I feel like those are that's the background that I've received from the school of social work. Well, thank you so much for sharing those experiences and for illuminating how you move through them with communities, uh, with your, your coworkers and colleagues. Um, I just want to note about the Q&A. So I see some questions coming in. Thank you so much. Um, let's continue to use this Q&A function. And then we're going to save time at the end to uh, invite Selena to answer your questions. Uh, uh, that you add to chat or the Q&A function. All right. Um, so Selena, you talk about, you know, when you're working with people on the worst day of their lives, um, how important relationships are. And can you speak to the importance of relationships, especially when we're dealing with crisis? Sure. 
Well, when you have relationships with people, um, you know, fundamental in relationships is also trust, right? You're more likely to talk to people and go to people that you trust. And one of the things that I've really learned at the Red Cross is, you know, good disaster response is building on what you do every single day. So what you, you already have in place. So if a disaster happens in a city in your community and there's not relationships and there's not trust with the Red Cross, it's not going to go well and help will not get to people faster if there isn't already established relationships and trust. So I think that is, that's core. I mean, the Red Cross is a community organization and that's what we're trying to do every single day to make sure that we are working directly with community partners, local leaders um, that are the ones that we can go to when thing, you know, things are not you know, falling apart in the world. And then when things do happen, we already have those established relationships to be able to go to them to say, this is what's happening. Happening. This is where you can get help. This is where the shelters are. Can your volunteer, you know, does your volunteer speak Spanish? And this is a predominantly Spanish speaking community. Can you help us communicate um, the resources that the Red Cross has? Um, so I think that's what's so important is that we also know that people are more willing to come to us. One of the, some of the work that I've been most proud of at the Red Cross has been some of the work that we've done around Latino engagement. So we've seen in the last few years that the Latino community has um, sometimes during disasters, whether it's Houston um, and California, some other places, Texas, where some of the, where there's been large scale disasters like Hurricane Harvey or Hurricane Laura that happened in Louisiana and Latino community was fearful of coming to the to the Red Cross of an association that it might be part of the government, their you know information may be shared. They may just not have known because of language access. And so the Red Cross is deploying, and I've worked with teams to actually get people on the ground that work with local volunteers who speak the speak the language, um, who are able to support communities. So if the community is not going to come to us, we're going to go to them, and we will ensure that they have shelter, they have food, they have clothing, they have the supplies that they need um, after a major disaster. And so I think that those are kind of relationships are just key to the work that we do every single day. That That is so key. And I, I'm so grateful for you highlighting uh, how important it is to recognize some of those access barriers to care and how you're proactive uh, with reaching out to communities. Um, to that point, I've heard you speak in other interviews uh, about, you know, really being able to identify community strengths and not just identifying them as vulnerable. Um, and I'm so interested in hearing more about that, um, if you don't mind speaking to that directly. Sure. I mean, I, I really, I understand that we have to use vulnerable and we often use it in the Red Cross when we're, we're trying to, it's kind of a data point of trying to explain um, information about a community. So it could be the socioeconomic status that makes a community vulnerable or, you know, high levels of crime and that makes it vulnerable. But I really try to say more often it's under-resourced, right? Communities are under-resourced. They're not vulnerable. I don't think that we should start talking about communities from a deficit perspective. And I think sometimes when we use vulnerable and we don't have that greater context, that's what we're doing. And really we lose how many strengths are within every single community has its strengths, every single community has its leaders. Um, and every community truly knows what it needs, right? And it, it, it requires us to be able to listen um, to those communities and talk with communities to really understand what their needs are um, before kind of making assumptions or moving into do work that that may not be in the best interest of that community. That is, that is such a critical point. Thank you so much for talking about how communities have their leaders and how we are, it's, we're, it's important that we listen um, and that we respond according to the leadership that these communities are providing to themselves. Um, and I, I, again, as I've, as I've listened to your previous interviews, you've talked about you know, really working with communities, not just outside of them and alongside of them. So thank you for um, your insight on this in particular. Um, you know, I've also heard you talk about extending grace, and I think that is such an important concept during this difficult time um, for so many families, for so many individuals. Can you talk about what it means to extend grace and then how you apply that with your um, colleagues as well? Sure. Um, you know, I think for all of us and, I, you know, as Red Crossers, I mean, I remember so many of the disasters that we faced 
before the pandemic and how challenging we, they were. And we, we always talked about what we thought the worst one was or how hard it was. And, and then we were faced like all of us with this a pandemic. And um, so I, you know, in March, uh, you know, 2020 for all of us, when our world started to shut down and, you know, I, I remember even when, you know, many of us, we sent people home and thinking it was going to be for a couple of weeks and little did we know. And, and then I, you know, so we started within my team and in my region, we started doing weekly calls with our staff and weekly calls with our volunteers, just checking it. And once we also really realized, and it certainly hit me by April, I'm not going to see these people for a while, for a lot. I mean, how do we take care of people that we can't in a way that Red Crosses are about hugs and connected, being connected to each other. Um, and I, I'm not going to be with them. How will I take care of them? I can't be with them. And you're also really starting to see that people were really starting to struggle. You know, people that were now, you know, working completely from home, this was shut down, you know, so kind of all the stay at home orders that were happening, people were at home with their children trying to get them on screens. So we had an all staff meeting call in April. And I told them the story. So I, I, I want to share it with you. So one of my mentors um, told told me this story, and I, I shared it with my staff. And so he, he told me that he has a friend who is an editor of a parenting magazine. And he's always trying to observe parents who are doing great and good with their children so he can include it in his magazine, in his monthly magazine. So the editor was going into a grocery store and he sees this young mother come in with her child who is screaming and yelling at the top of her lungs. She's about a year old and she's in the shopping cart, clearly there against her will. And he hears the young mother say, it's okay, Jennifer, it's okay. We're gonna get the bread, the eggs and the milk. And then we're gonna go to the cashier and we're gonna check out and we're gonna go to our car and drive home. And he was so impressed with how calm this mother was as this child was screaming and he was wondering how long she could continue to do this. And so the mother is now going through the, the grocery store and he's still hearing this child screaming at the top of their lungs. And then here comes the mother now down the aisle that he's in. And he again hears the mother say, it's okay, Rebecca, now we have the bread and now we're gonna get the eggs and the milk and we're gonna go to the cashier and we're gonna get into our car and drive home. And he was like, wow, this mother is really doing it. And so he's like, you know, I just, I really need to get a chance to talk to her. So he goes to the cashier because he clearly knows that's where she's headed. The child is still screaming their head off. He, the mother walks up to the cashier and she says, it's okay, Rebecca. It's okay. We have the milk, the bread and the eggs. And now we're going to get them and we're going to pay the cashier and we're going to get into our car and we're going to drive home. And he goes up to the mother. He's like, excuse me, if you don't mind, if I could talk to you for a minute, I just need to tell you, I'm a parent, you know, an editor for a parenting magazine. And I just need to tell you what an incredible job you're doing supporting young Rebecca here. And just what a great job you are providing support to your young daughter, Rebecca. And she looks at him and she says, oh no, I'm Rebecca. And when I told that story, you know, to my staff and I immediately then said, you know, if you're like me this week, you know, in the chat or raise your hand, put a thumbs up if you did one of these things. And I said, forgot to send an email, copied the wrong person on an email. Um, you know, completely lost track of time, uh, had to turn off my camera for five minutes because I just couldn't look at my screen anymore. And my chat, the chat was filled with people saying, that's me. Yes, I'm Rebecca. Um, and, you know, I really, it me, you know, when we're able to demonstrate to others, I, and I really did get some heartfelt messages from staff who, you know, some members of my team who said, I've been really struggling so much. And to hear the CEO say that they're struggling made it okay for me. I, you know, that I'm okay, I'm doing okay. And so I just really think, you know, I, you know, especially for people, Red Crossers, they're gonna go out, they are type A personalities. They're gonna go out and give everything they've got and how much, and, it's, and I think of social workers are the same exact way. They're always gonna be putting everybody else forward before themselves. And so we need to remind people um, in these moments to be able to give each other grace, which means being compassionate, which means being thoughtful, which means, and really most of the time we're not giving ourselves grace. Right. I, and I know I'm usually one of the people that's hardest on myself before I'm hard on another people and to remind ourselves to also not only give other people grace, but to give ourselves grace. 
Wow, that story was so visceral. And I was so locked into your <laughs> telling of it. Thank you so much for sharing um, and for just reiterating how important it is to extend grace. You know, I can just imagine how your staff responds to you because I'm, you know, I've never met you in person, but I'm like, thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much. And, you know, I also am curious about, you know, for Latinos, for women, for women of color, you know, why is this notion of extending grace to ourselves so important? Um, is that something you could, uh, again, share with us? Sure, sure. No, I, it, and um, I know you mentioned in my introduction is uh, uh, one of the most powerful Latinos. And so one, the, the, the most uh, thing that I'm probably most proud of when it comes to that is that uh, my father and I were pictured right next to each other. So my father was also on the list of 25 most powerful Latinos. So that was the thing that I was most proud of uh, to actually be able to finally be on a list with, with my father was a true honor. Um, my son, who was 17, seemed less impressed by that. I keep trying to tell him, you know, you have to do your homework because I'm a powerful Latino and he just doesn't. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but, you know, I think that particularly women of color, you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it, you're the first or you may be the only, you know, um, I, you know, very much still to this day sit at tables where I'm the only one. Um, I may be the only woman um, sitting at certain tables. And I think more that is really a space where not, it's just not about grace, but really believing that you have a reason to be there, that you belong there. Um, and, and I'm really grateful that, you know, I, I do work with a team and I work in an organization where I don't think they see me as the, the first Latina leader for the Illinois Red Cross, but they really see them, they see me as their leader, as their, you know, as someone that works alongside them, that works, I've never asked my team members to do anything that I wouldn't do. You know, we had, you know, over 180 volunteers from the Illinois region go out and deploy across the country this year. And they do this every single year. I mean, thousands of Red Cross volunteers, and which is why it's been so personally important to me to do the same thing. Um, but, you know, I, I just think that we, we need to do as much as we can to really think about representation representation matters. Um, and I, I know I was so lucky and fortunate to have many uh, mentors, other Latino leaders that really not, you know, literally open, held open doors, windows, all of their way through. I, I, I really do know that I sit in this chair today because they opened those doors and walked that path before I did. Um, but it, you know, it was just a few years ago that I was speaking at um, a networking event for Latino uh, leaders or and there was and I had a couple young women come up to me and one of them was kind of teary eyed and said and I've never met a Latina CEO before and you know it just it took my breath away um, and that you know really thinking about that responsibility but also knowing we, we have to do better and we do need to do more to make sure that um, the Latina community um, people of color can see mirror images of themselves um, in leadership positions. Thank you so much for speaking directly to the folks who have been, you know, are on the other side of those doors who we're still inviting in and making space for. It, it does feel emotional to hear you speak directly to that. So I am, um, you know, I can sense the teary eyed person coming up to you because um, I've been that teary eyed person in many spaces. <laughs> um, so I, I really want to honor the questions that folks who are here with us have shared in the Q&A. And so I wanna uh, go to those right now. Um, so first of all, I just wanna quote, Selena is such an incredible, inspiring speaker. <laughs> um, and so the question here is, how did Selena hone her wonderful flow in public speaking? Um, and this is from a Red Crosser and volunteer. Thank you for all you do. <laughs> Oh, oh, thank you so much, Ray. I know, and I should acknowledge, um, I have some incredible Red Cross team members that are on the call today. And so thank you for taking I, time out of what I know, they have very, very busy schedules. And so I just appreciate them taking time to be with us. Um, so I will say that it's taken a a lot of years of practice. I know certainly even from my previous job, um, 
serving as the executive director, I used to, especially when we used to be in person and doing events, and I would actually have to, I spent a lot of time practicing. Um, and I remember even with podiums, I used to do this thing where, and my, I had a development officer who used to pile up books and make me stand in front of it because I used to like move um, a lot. And as you can also tell, this is kind of the Latina thing too, is I tend to talk with my hands a lot, which is not usually, I have a great chief communications officer now who's gotten me a little bit better, at least about um, during actual interviews, I can't really be. And when you're on kind of television, interestingly enough, as soon as I get off of this conversation today, there's going to be a CBS two is waiting to interview me. So if you could actually see my desk right now in terms of preparation, I have notes all over um, my desk as it relates to the current blood shortage we are in and the numbers and the talking points. And so I will just say thank you so much, but I will say I, I have to practice a lot and I have really great people around me. I have an amazing chief communication officer who does a lot to um, support me in making sure that I can communicate our story. But I will have to say when I can speak about our volunteers, it's the thing that I love speaking most about because it's our most powerful story to tell. 90% um, of our work is done by our volunteers who go out every single day and carry out the mission of the Red Cross. So um, I feel like that usually comes easiest for me because it's the thing I love talking about the most. Thank you so much. Um, all right. So, and and thank you, folks, for writing in questions. You can, you're welcome to continue to do that. We have time. So, okay. Uh, can you share how you made the move from direct practice to macro practice, um, and how did you translate those skills? Sure, that's a great question. Um, when I started at um, Erie Neighborhood House, I was actually I started there. Uh, my first job there, and I moved up. I was there for 15 years. I was the social worker for in their Head Start program, so I was doing direct practice. I was working directly with incoming children and families. I was working along, you know, doing unfortunately just a lot of work around child abuse and neglect in that space, um, and working directly with um, city entities and DCFS um, during that time as well. Um, and uh, then started thinking more about what I, I got very interested in the policy pieces of what we were doing. I think that's really what started. I um, really started to understand what it meant for particularly Head Start families that at the time, you know, to be eligible for Head Start, a Head Start in the um, late 90s, you needed to, and I don't know how much it's completely changing, a family of two needed to make, be making less than $14,000 a year. To be eligible for child care assistance in Illinois, a family of two needed to be making less than $28,000 a year. And it, it really, you know, families can't work unless they have child care. And so when I really started to hear and see families coming in, I started getting more interested in the policy work. I started getting pulled into more of the city commission's conversations, um, which also inspired me to go back and get my second master's in early childhood and really with a focus on the policy work. Um, and from there then moved into the executive director role at Erie, Erie Neighborhood House. You know, I think so many of the skills, again, um, when I think about what my, pe when, you know, I have um, people that are doing this work services to armed forces, their, you know, blood donation, we're doing, uh, I have fundraisers that are trying to raise dollars to be able to carry out our mission every single day. And so again, you know, this part around listening, um, problem solving, crisis management, I mean, really just supporting individuals that are going through a really challenging time trying to do their work, helping other people that are going through a challenging time. Um, those are all the skill sets that you keep, you know. It, I will say it was interesting, if for those of you have, that have done Strengths Finder and you kind of, it like is the, you know, kind of online test and it tells you all the, the your, your main five strengths. So I actually took it um, before I became an executive director CEO, and then I took it after I became executive director CEO, and I had all the same um, strengths. I commun a communicator, organizer. The only one that dropped, which was interesting, was empathy, which was really I'm like, how do I? How did that happen? I became a CEO and I became less empathetic. But I, I think there was a piece of that you know, um, running the business part of it became very real, right? I, I think when I was a program person and it, it was all very clear about the mission, the work they were doing, 
And then when you're sitting there and you're looking at, you know, you're in a state budget crisis in Illinois and you don't know when you're going to be able to, you're looking at payroll and, you know, are you going to, and you're extending your line of credit and you're trying to make sure your teachers get paid and you have the things that becomes a little bit more real of, you know, having to make difficult decisions where, you know, at different times in my career, I've had to lay people off. And those are some of the hardest things I've ever had to do. And so I think those skill sets were kind of grew with me when I, when I changed into different roles. Thank you so much for sharing that. I was only laughing because of the grad student part of me was like, I, I think you're empathetic. I think there might be something with the measures, <laughs> uh, but the stereotype about CEOs. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so what advice can you give for young Latino women or just young women in general who want to be in leadership positions similar to yours in the future? Sure. Um, you know, I think very much to and it's hard because I think as I've gotten older, I, I trust myself more. Um, and, you know, you kind of believe in yourself more at a certain point. point. And I think also as you get older, you also care a little bit less about what people think. Um, and so I would probably say if you can start to do that earlier, um, it's, I think it's really helpful. I think it's good for your soul. I think it's good for you and your careers to um, know that you are exactly who you are, um, that you are doing the best that you can, that you will, you really are qualified to be where you are and um, that you have something to offer, um, that your voice is valuable and to speak up when you can. Um, you know, I think that I've, I've done that later. And I think those are things that, um, you know, I really, you know, try to have different people around me all the time because I value diversity of thought. You know, I want people around me that think differently than me, that have had different experiences that are willing to say no, or I don't think so, or let's try something different. Um, so I think that those, uh, that's some of the advice that I would give. I, I trust my gut a lot. Um, I, I do check in with, with team members, um, but I think uh, certainly in the position that I'm in, um, I also believe in the importance of having teams, you know, be at the table together and collective decision making. But I also know there are times where I have no time and I've got to make a decision on the spot. Sometimes it's the right one. Sometimes it's not. Um, but more often than not, I try to at least check in with myself first uh, before making those decisions. But more often than not, I try to go with my gut. And I think people, I would say to trust yourselves. I love that. I love how you highlight not only relationships with other people, with your team, with your family, but you also have a relationship with yourself. And, and thank you so much for encouraging that self-relationship with your gut, as you put it. Um, so Selena, it's nice to see you and wonderful to hear your story. I'm quoting, <laughs> and, and I also mean that. Um, so I'm a nonprofit COO, Red Cross, DMH volunteer, and at UW-Madison grad. Oh, that's not a question. That's just a comment. <laughs> Okay, so here's a question. What advice do you have for women of color Latinas who are navigating predominantly white settings, graduate school, professional settings, and may experience imposter syndrome? Sure. Um, so I would say um, we've all had imposter syndrome. I, you know, still get imposter syndrome. I still you know, um, and, and certainly in our virtual world, I, I've had the experience, recently where, you know, sometimes because you don't realize it as much when you're kind of going through your day-to-day -day work, but um, several times in the last year, clearly I've been on a screen, you know, so I'm in a meeting or I'm in a conversation and I only see white male faces and, and then I see my face in the middle of the screen. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that I don't normally think about myself as a Latina in that way, or do I belong to be in a place until you kind of, when you see an image like that, it's really striking. I mean, and, and it kind of, um, it does take me a minute to kind of, it gives me pause. It still gives me pause to kind of think, do I belong here? Do I, you know, should I be careful about what I'm going to ask next? Or, you know, no one's asked this, should I ask this? Um, and I think we have to. You know, I, I think I would say is we, we all feel that sometimes I can feel that way multiple times in one day. Um, and it, you know, I think just more so that just to know that it is so important to have your voice, because I think once I've asked my question, someone will say, oh, I didn't think that before. Oh, that's a different perspective. Um, and you're adding so much when you do. And so I, that's probably what I would say most to just know that that feeling is real and it can be hard 
hard. I, it's, I know it's still hard for me sometimes when I see it and when I can kind of feel it in that way, um, but really to encourage, you know, our, our world and our society and the work that we do is so much better if we can hear from you and if we see you and if you participate, um, even if it can be scary um, at times to, to do that. Thank you. And, you know, it, it's so impressive to hear you practice what you preach in terms of um, talking about, you know, not just seeing communities as deficit oriented. So I, I hear you reflecting back to us how when you see yourself in that sea of whiteness Zoom room, um, you know, foregrounding your strengths that your voice is bringing something important, is asking a question that needs to be asked. Um, and so, you know, it, it's so striking to hear that. Um, so thank you. All right, so I just wanna to continue to encourage questions. Um, we have one more written here, but we have a little bit more time if anyone else would like to um, add a question to our Q&A. So um, this person says, first off, thank you so, <laughs> capital letters, so much Selena for speaking with us and for the important work you do. So my notebook is filled with powerful insights and advice. Second, <laughs> because so much of the work of Red Cross relies on volunteers as does many social work agencies. I wonder if you could speak a bit more about building relationships with volunteers uh, and recruiting and retaining them. Sure, that's a, this is a great question. Um, so as I mentioned, um, you know, volunteers are the backbone of the American Red Cross, 90% of our workforce. So I have 100 full-time staff, that's, you know, my employee base, but I've got 3,600 volunteers in the Illinois region. And, I will say one of the most powerful things about the Red Cross that I've experienced that, that is somewhat different from other organizations is that we literally cannot do our work. We cannot carry out our mission if we did not have volunteers. And so there really is, volunteers can do anything that, that our, my staff can do. A volunteer can do my job. You know, it, one of the things when I walked into the Red Cross, they really, you can't, you know, that's the most important thing to, that I experienced was that you couldn't see the difference. You couldn't tell the difference between a volunteer and a staff person, you know, and that volunteers are sitting there with us, carrying out this work, helping us um, make decisions for the organization. Um, I have had some great volunteer leaders that have provided um, organizational leadership and direct Council to me and support around some really difficult human resource issues. They've done great work on change management and project management. Um, and they've just really given us their expertise and skill set to this organization. And so I think, um, you know, in addition to responding to disasters and all the things that we do on a day to day basis. So I think that one of the things that I would say is, you know, when you value volunteers that way and you give them leadership roles and responsibilities, um, that really contributes to their, you know, ability. The fact is that they, they're giving up their time, which is one of the most important things that any of us have. And so if, if, the, if we give them those roles and responsibilities and we entrust them to do that, I think we see the benefit tenfold. And so to kind of think about within organizations if your organization isn't already thinking about doing that. Now, the other part of that is I know not every organization also has, you know, you do have to have a supervisor or a point person. You know, it's a lot of people, you know, certainly during the budget cuts or other constraints around organizations, they had to get rid of their volunteer coordinator or their volunteer services department. And that's hard. I have an entire team that is focused on volunteers, recruiting, supporting volunteers to the best of our ability. Um, I think in this virtual environment, it's been it's been hard. Um, a lot of our work has then shifted to being virtual. Um, certainly, when we went through a really difficult disaster season last year, not all of our volunteers could go out in person. A lot of our volunteers were immune compromised. Other things that would prevent them from going out and deploying. Um, and so I'm really grateful to all of those that have, have stuck with us kind of to re-engage in terms of the work that we're doing in person. But I do think it really takes dedicated staff people um, to be able to continue to make sure that you're communicating with volunteers regularly. That's a huge thing that we hear. We wanna be kept in the loop in terms of what's going on in the region with the organization. We have regular volunteer calls that we do to make sure. The other thing is volunteers can also help support other volunteers. You know, So we have volunteers that help 
help us also do that and have key roles within our volunteer relations team to make sure that we're also celebrating volunteers and their work. And that's also equally as important. We do a great volunteer recognition awards every year, which is great and kind of have this year, we had to do it virtually where we're at least able to call out some of our incredible volunteers. And I, we have volunteers that have been with us 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And um, it's just uh, still incredible to me. When I first started the Red Cross, I met a couple who uh, told me that they, you know, she's like, oh, well, we volunteer together, her and her husband. She said, in, and, you know, we've been to, and she started lift. she's like, Frank, we've been to Hurricane Rita and Sandy. And, you know, she was like listing off. She goes, we just kind of keep a bag by the door. And when you guys call, we, we go. And so um, it's, you know, I think that it takes work and it takes dedicated effort within organizations to support volunteers. But what you get back in return is just beyond what you thought you would, you're actually giving. Um, well, it really comes through how much you value your volunteers and their contribution to leadership. Um, and I just really appreciate how explicit you are about um, not treating volunteers as extra and how you demonstrate your valuing of volunteers is through communication, through celebrating them. Um, and it really comes through that it seems like you really love your volunteers. Um, so thank you and, and thank you for the question. Okay, so please talk about how you manage multiple stakeholders relationships, such as board members, media, community members with different perspectives. That's a great question. Um, so one of the things, and I probably have not mentioned, is that I, you know, the Red Cross, uh, the largest humanitarian organization in the world, and we carry out our mission every day based on our fundamental principles. And um, one of the things that has just been a pillar for me in the work that we're doing with so much noise, so many things that are going on, so many conversations, a lot of divide in our world, in our country, is um, that the Red Cross principles of neutrality, humanity, um, universality, really, you know, they, they compel us to go out into the world and to, to be neutral, to, you know, and not, not saying you're doing anything doesn't mean that's not how you're not neutral, neutral, right? So we're going out, we are taking positions against racism and hatred and saying, that's not what humanitarians do. So that's not about that, but really kind of saying, you know, that we're not going to sit, take sides. I mean, we have, as part of our international work, we have international red workers, part of the International Federation of the Red Cross that are in parts of the world that unless they stay neutral, their lives are at stake, right? So that that um, people know that the Red Cross is not on either side and so they can continue to carry out humanitarian aid no matter where they are in the world. Um, so very often I'm able to say, you know, I'm not, you know, we can't speak to this. We're not going to take a position on this because we will serve all people. We help all people no matter what. Um, and so I, I think that I'll say that in terms of kind of thinking about positions, you know, multiple stakeholders, right? So there's different, um, you know, my, I have an incredible board of directors who I would also say are the, some of the most dedicated volunteers that I have. My board members are volunteers and they're doing this work. Um, the media um, have been, you know, they're our greatest partners. I, we have great relationships that we, we really count on the media to be able to tell our story, um, not just when things are going wrong in the world, but also just regularly about the work, you know, again, um, we're facing a national blood shortage right now. We have the lowest blood levels that we've had in five years during this time. And typically we start to see a blood shortage in the winter months when people start to get sick, they're going out less, schools and universities close, but to have a blood shortage happening this early is really, um, uh, you know, is, is really a concern for patients that are depending on blood that we're hearing the stories, you know, you know, patients need are in hospitals, they need blood and it's not there. Um, so I would say, you know, it's a, you know, with the media, we're working with them to kind of communicate the urgency and ensure that they're telling our stories. Um, board members are, are another um, group of individuals and clearly staff. So I think that um, I really try to stay key to our mission, talk about that, that 
is meaningful to every single stakeholder. Um, telling the story of our Red Cross um, you know, volunteers is something that is across the board meaningful to each and every one of our stakeholders. So I, I, I hope that's that I answer your question, but kind of to give you an idea of, um, we do need to navigate some of those and we kind of rely back on our principles of neutrality and to just not take a position on things that would prevent us from carrying out humanitarian aid. Great, thank you so much. So we're somewhat approaching the end of our time together and I wanna give you time at the end to share any closing comments or reflections for us. Um, and I also want time to just thank you again. Um, and so we just have one final question that invites you to speak to, is there anything that you would change or any hopes you might have for the Red Cross that you'd like to speak to? So, um, I get to work with superheroes. Um, they are, um, and I, I, I just, it's truly an honor to be able to work alongside them. And uh, I, I, I've shared this story a couple of times. I, the Red Cross, the Illinois Red Cross um, carried out one of the largest vaccine distribution efforts um, uh, over the course of this past year. And, um, we were at multiple um, vaccination sites across Illinois. We, by the end of the four months that we were doing the vaccination efforts, um, we had helped vaccinate over 275,000 people. Um, I had the great honor and privilege of working at one of the vaccination sites um, every Friday for those first three months. And so it was in a gymnasium of a community college. And you know, it was a really surreal moment to kind of say, we're standing there of all the things that I thought that we did. And in this moment, we were trying to vaccinate, you know, literally save lives through vaccination. Um, and so, you know, you have the area where people check in for their vaccine, then the tables with the with the nurses that were actually putting shots in arms, and then there was the observation area where I was a lot of the time where people had to sit for 15 minutes um, during their after getting their vaccine. And then I was also then working with them through, you know. Um, a tablet to book their second appointment. So it was like letting people know you've got to come back. Sometimes we were, I was translating, doing this in Spanish. It was, especially in those first couple of, of weeks and months, it was individuals that, um, elderly healthcare workers. So sometimes it was people bringing in their grandmother, their mother, their, and I, I remember that fir very first week when those doors opened and we had people coming through and it was mostly healthcare and elderly. And this woman's walking through and she looked at me and I was kind of getting her ready to go up to her, to where she was going to get her shot. And she, and she was holding her card and she was so happy. And so this was like probably end of January. And I said, um, Oh, I said, is, is this your first shot? She goes, yes, it is. Thank you so much. And then she kind of looked at me and she goes, have you gotten yours yet and I said no 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 we have to let um we have to let all of you go first and then and then they'll get to us and then she goes oh thank you so much for letting the grandparents go first and my you know I I thought about you know my grandparents had not hugged my son you know and what that felt like and you know to be able to see her go up and get her shot and and then move over and um for all of those people, you, you remembered their, you know, and I, I really did think about, you know, what it was going to be like when she was a, finally able to hug her grandchildren. Um, and so I just think about that kind of work and be, being able to do that alongside Red Crossers is, has been one of the, the greatest gifts of my life. Um, and I just so feel so fortunate from what I've also just been learned, having been able to be at the Red Cross and doing this work, particularly during this time where we just never quite know what disaster is going to be in front of us, um, but we know that we're going to be able to be there to respond. You know, you started off that response talking about how you work with superheroes. Um, and then it struck me that, you know, these are not actual superheroes. These are just people who you encounter in your day-to-day -day work and life. Um, but what makes them so super is how they approach their work, how they approach their loved ones, how they approach you in this little interaction. Um, and it is so uh, affecting. So thank you so much for sharing these stories with us. Um, and thank you for sharing your time, your wisdom, you know, for me as someone who is a current student at UW-Madison, who has been isolated through uh, the social distancing period, um, and also as a woman of color, 
you know, it has been so uplifting to get to sit with you for an hour. Um, and I imagine for so many of the people who are with us, you have brought that joy into their home. So I cannot thank you enough for the time you've given us today and for your family, your staff, uh, the volunteers who are here with us who we can't see. Um, I just want to honor that we're in community together right now. Uh, are there any closing comments or reflections you'd like to send us with? I just want to give you space. Sure. No, thank you so much for just having this conversation and being able to be with you today. It really is, has been an honor. Um, you know, I think that just in terms of also adding to that around, you know, how do we take care of ourselves? You know, what do we do? Um, and I have a, I have a 17 year old, um, son, as I mentioned, so just thinking about uh, women of color and where we've worked and what we do and how we take care of ourselves and how do, how do we kind of do it all? Um, I don't think we can always do it all. Um, you know, I was a single mother for, I recently was married, got married, um, but uh, for a significant part of my time, I, I had my son and my parents who um, I can't imagine doing this without my parents. And so I, I say that with all the privilege in the world of knowing, you know, that even as a single mother, I had parents who were like second parents to my son and helped me raise them. And when I think about single parents who have no support, no help, no access, no resources. Um, so I miss things. Um, I just, I... Um, I missed uh, plays. I've missed kind of sometimes I've missed soccer games, um, you know, and I think that, you know, we try to do as much as we can. And I, I think that once we know that I, we can have it all just as long as it's our interpretation and, and it's what all it is means to us, you know, so we can have it all as long as we just are real about what it, we want it to be. Um, and so I think that that's what I would also say to um, other women who are thinking about careers and work and life and, and also that it doesn't have to include children and families. It can be whatever it is. It doesn't have to necessarily include a partner. And um, I have incredible friends and colleagues that are running organizations with families, without families. Um, and so I just think that there's also that kind of societal piece that also goes along that influences us as we're also trying to do our work. And so I think that just knowing that whatever path um, women choose, um, what people of color with any social worker decides to choose is, is okay for them. And they're still um, offering so much to this world of value. Um, thank you for such comforting closing remarks uh, to send us with. And I'm so appreciative that you we're so real with us um, and also talked about the joys and the struggles of this work of serving uh, people in our communities and our lives. So that is all I have for this program. I want to check in with the um, administrators and Steph. <laughs> I see her coming back on and I'll pass the mic on. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, d I just want to thank you both. I mean, uh, obviously, Selena, for taking time out of your very busy schedule to talk with us. Um, so we're so grateful for your insight. And Sungmi, you know, as usual, you didn't disappoint. You know, you're just such a lovely human being and thoughtful and a good listener. So thank you for doing such a good job moderating and interviewing Selena today. Um, and thank you to all the participants who sent in um, questions and um, comments. And I guess a shout out to Selena's family and friends too, who I know have joined. Thank you for um, supporting her in being such a lovely human, human being. Um, so thank you everybody. Have a great rest of your day. <laughs>